Welcome. Once again, we have a very, very special guest tonight. Obviously, he has a Beyond Vaudeville connection. That's why he's here with us. But he's also here with us uh, to talk over his amazing career. Uh, he's been very generous to join us here tonight. He was generous uh, way back when, when he joined us on Beyond Vaudeville. I just want to go over a little bit of, of uh, what this man has done. He's an actor, playwright, theater director, instructor, um, he's been known for so many movies, but I'm just going to rattle off some of them. Uh, Skidoo, Catch-22, What's Up, Doc? The Front Page, The Muppet Movie, Short Circuit, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, My Cousin Vinny, Amistad, A Beautiful Mind, Finding Nemo. I feel like I've just walked through my entire uh, movie-going career uh, going through that. He's acted so much in theater um, uh, very early on in Fiddler on the Roof, the original in 1964, and then did uh, much acting over the years. Uh, also has directed much in the theater. Um, Little Foxes, famously, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's debut on Broadway back in 1981. Three Sisters in 2011, famously, uh, but again, many, many productions. Um, I, it would take the entire show to go over them all. Um, also a playwright. Um, he's written Uncle Bob, Booth, Orson's Shadow, about his uh, experience with Orson Welles, uh, uh, inspired by his experience with Orson Welles on Catch-22. Um, so, you know, to me, this guy is the real uh, six degrees. Um, but uh, much like Kevin Bacon, he's uh, had so many um, amazing uh, uh, projects that he's worked on and has worked with so many people. Um, and I want to now introduce, here he is, the man himself, Austin Pendleton. Hi there, Rich. Hi. Hi, Austin. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm I sure you're so tired of hearing these credits rattled off all the time. No, but... I'm not tired of it at all. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, should, should I go through it again? Yeah, yeah. Go through it again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
right. so uh, so Austin, I noticed um, we're going to talk about your appearance on Beyond Vaudeville eventually, but. And you know, I noticed one of the comments that uh, that a viewer wrote on that appearance was, "Austin is so adorable." Um, <laughs> the New Yorker uh, recently called you a babe magnet, um, and I looked at a, a post on Instagram where someone wrote, "I crossed paths with him in a subway station here in New York City. He was walking by, and I recognized him and called out his name. He came toward me with a big smile on his face and said hello, and we shook hands." We chatted for a few minutes, and he is a real sweetheart of a guy. So well, that's nice. Not does everybody love time. you, Austin? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, so so that so I, I don't know if you remember who this woman was, but so somebody, if somebody were to come up on the street and say that, you know, oh hello, Mr. Pendleton, we loved your work. Oh, yeah, because that doesn't happen that often, actually. So I do remember it. And I think I know. I think I remember that encounter. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that it doesn't happen often. But um, but uh, I, if, I'm, I'm going to go with what you're telling me. Um, so um, so I, one thing that I found and, and by the way, I see people are already uh, writing in chat. And uh, yes, uh, you know, write your comments, write your questions. And we'll try to get to some of those uh, as we're here with uh, Mr. Pendleton. Um, so, um, one of the things I, I noticed that I, I didn't know about you, um, was that your mom was actually someone who taught theater. Well, she was a professional actress. Mm -hmm. Um, she was beginning her career and, and, um, at the Cleveland Playhouse. And my father was born and grew up in Warren, Ohio, which is about an hour east of Cleveland, almost when you get to Pennsylvania. And he saw her at a play at the Cleveland Playhouse, and he was smitten. And um, he um, and they began to see each other, and they and they uh, and he um, um, proposed. And I think she no she um, um, she had her eye on a on a, on a career, so she moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And she stayed in one of those houses that they don't have anymore, but they had back in the 1930s for for young actresses where where there there would be a curfew, they would go out on a date, and the and the guy would bring them there, and 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 that they would sit in the living room together, mm -hmm. and then the guy would be dismissed by the people who by by the lady who ran the house, and and mom would go upstairs and to her her room, then. Um, then my dad came to New York again and ran into each other and that he ran into her in Sardi's, you know, the big, big theatrical restaurant in New mm -hmm. York. And, um, she was going to, she'd gotten a big job. There was a play by Lillian Hellman called The Children's Hour, mm -hmm. which is about, um, two teachers who are accused of being, of of being of being in a lesbian relationship by a student, one of the um, one of the teachers is in fact a lesbian, and the other is not. And then there are there are all the young girls in the play who are at the school, and the, and some of those are pretty flashy parts. So my mom got a part in the national tour of one of those flashy parts of one of the students, and that was a huge deal because it was a it was the, it was a national tour of the Children's Hour, which had just been on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And then, at the last minute, the tour was canceled because a lot of towns on the tour didn't want to play and did not want to play in their town that had a lesbian in it. Uh, and what year was this? This was around. This was in the mid nineteen thirties. Gotcha. And so my dad proposed again, and she thought, "What the hell? This profession is too unsteady." And she and she so she she got married to him in 1938. And two years later, I was born. And then and then my younger brother was born a year and a half later. Right around. He was born just before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And and my sister, uh, who was born a few years later, was born. Just before Hiroshima. <laughs> wow. And you, now your dad was named Thorne, right? Thorn. T -O -R -N? Um, he Thorne was a family last name. 
Okay. It was the maiden name of, of his mother. Okay. Yeah. And he went by that. So, um, so yeah, so, but then I, I, so I read that your mom, you know, I guess maybe later in her life was teaching acting and, and, um, um, and well, she, the, so af, after World War II, mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, the community of Warren, Ohio, and it, 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 which is in a county called um, uh, Trumbull County, mm -hmm. uh, came to her because they wanted to start a community theater and they wanted her advice and her help. And, and so they called themselves Trumbull New Theater. In other words, TNT. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and she began to work with them and she, she would act in their, sh in their shows and direct their shows. And this went on for years and years and years. She worked with them till after dad died and she moved to the Boston area where my sister lives. And but in 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 the 40 years, she um, um, she practically every season, she either acted in a show or she would direct a show or sometimes in the same season, she would direct a show and act in a show. And on Saturday mornings, she would teach acting to to teenagers and were you among in those, those was among among those was roger ailes roger ailes who yeah. eventually became the fox news czar yeah. now yeah. he's passed away um yeah. and uh was uh yeah he was quite a colorful character to say the least um oh, was he, he like he was, that when he was younger he was a great guy uh huh. <laughs> and 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 he grew up with a harshly Republican father in the days before they were harshly Republican. I mean, his father was a fanatic uh, Republican, and um, um, but but Roger, when Roger moved to New York, he he paced the streets because he wanted to um to get involved in theater. He'd been in the classes that my mom taught and everything. And so he went in the office of Kermit Bloomgarden, who was a very famous uh, producer on Broadway and who was very far left in his politics. I mean, he, he, he was known for that. And he produced all kinds of, he produced the O'Neill plays and the Arthur Miller plays. And he produced musicals like The Music Man and stuff. And he produced Look Home and Angel and The Diary of Anne Frank. And he was very left wing and, and Roger took up with him. And Kermit, Kermit Bloomgarden really admired Roger mm -hmm. and um, sent Roger out to look for shows that were in, in showcase productions that they would want to, to move into. Um, so And so Roger found a showcase production of the Hotel Baltimore. And so Kermit uh, produced that on uh, off-Broadway and it ran forever. Mm -hmm. so, so that was Roger Ailes. Wow. And, but and then eventually who went on to produce. With, who had studied with my mom. Gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, did you study with your mom? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. We and, would act, we, we, we were acting in place. I, I would have small parts, she would have large parts in the productions at TNT. And before we would go to rehearse, the, re the rehearsals were always in the evenings. Mm -hmm. She would say, now, before we go, this director has a huge job on our hands. I want you to know, I want you to have some knowledge of what you're doing because this director, it's a huge cast. She, she doesn't have time to teach you acting. So when you, um, when you come into the bar, there's a scene in a bar uh, as a kid, um, where are you coming from? I said, from backstage. She said, no, no, where are you coming from? Where, from the street or where, where are you coming from? So she made me answer all these questions before we would go to the rehearsals. Huh. And, and those I, then I began to learn how to work. Yeah, and now, um, so, and you uh, famously um, had a, a stutter when you, uh, that, that had started when you were younger. I and um, what, what did your mom, think about that? Did she think that that was going to be an impediment to you? Well, I think that she, I mean, it seemed to go away when I was acting. Sometimes it didn't. 
but but often it did. Mm-hmm. It it would go away when I was acting. So that's part of what drew me into acting. I, I because I you know in in my beginning when I was about eight years old or something, and then in my teen years and so forth, I it was a terrible stutter, and and but I would get on stage and 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 it would go it would it would very often it would go away. Wow! So if so, you just acted twenty four hours a day, you'd be fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so I. Uh, um and so it it um it was um so that was a um yeah so that that was actually similar to the uh the the late singer Mel Tillis right where he would stutter but then when he would sing he wouldn't stutter at all oh oh well nobody stutters when they sing ah yeah yeah okay that was never an issue no for you no, I well, and I, but I didn't really begin to sing until I got into New York. Um, I, I was, um, um, and I and my agent told me you should get a singing teacher. So I started, and then within a year, I was able to audition for Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, huh. okay. Yeah. All right. So, so we're going to talk uh, more about your career, Austin, but I I want to uh, just uh, share um, the moment, uh, the moments when you were on Beyond Vaudeville. So this was going back in 1990. um, And it was a very full show when you were on. I don't know how much of this you remember, but we're going to look at some brief clips. Um, But you were sharing uh, the show with Irene, the gong show queen of Long Island, Yes, um, yes, Ada sir. Love, who was the fairy godmother of New York, yes. uh, a woman from the Raelians who believed that mankind was created in laboratories by aliens, yes. um, Lady Betty Aberlin from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yes. Uh, and, you know, frankly, for me, it was a very stressful day because we had so many people that we were trying to get on to that show. But I'm I'm going to just play some quick clips and then we'll get some of your thoughts okay. on this experience. Okay. Uh, and here we go. Well, we'd like to bring uh, out our next guest, uh, who's very well known as the uh, queen of the uh, gong shows. I'm so happy. I'm so gay. Oh, I can come twice a day. I'm your mailman. I lift your knocker, ring your bell, and you think that I am swell, I'm your a mailman. And maybe you could explain uh, what exactly Relian is to people in New York who might not be aware of it. Uh, yes, this is an int- international movement for to welcome the extraterrestrial who are our creators mm-hmm. in laboratories. Mm-hmm. And there you can find them in the original Bible in Hebrew and their name Elohim. And it means those who came from the sky. Mm-hmm. And uh, those people created humanity in laboratories and they sent all the prophets like Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad to prepare the time where we are now, which is the age of the apocalypse. Hello, Ada Love. I'm so happy to talk to you. What should I do? I have a problem. My husband, he just wants to eat his pancakes in the morning breakfast and sit all day and watch TV. I can't do a thing with it. I'm very vivacious. uh, Mr. Pendleton, uh, one thing I like about your movies is they're usually very uh, upbeat uh, like Short Circuit and yeah. uh, What's Up Doc and uh-huh. uh, uh, lots of fun uh, movies. Um, do you like to to movies like that, like Simon? That are, no, those uh, are the movies I get. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't get to be in those other movies. Okay. Uh, uh, perhaps that will, no, let me, well, um, uh, but I like things like Miller's, I haven't seen Miller's Crossing, it's so I can't even, movie. I'm sure it is there. I, I've seen their other it pictures. It looks like Hopper paintings. Yeah, they're wonderful. And, and also, it's extraordinarily uh, violent. There are so many deaths that each death has to be more uh, interesting than the. Well, Shakespeare is violent, you know. I've been in some Shakespeare mm. in the theater, not in the movies. But, uh, well, Shake- so is our society. There's yeah, and so was Shakespeare's society. Oh, probably so. Very, well, uh, hideously so. And I, it, I'm sorry. It, if, I mean, and I guess in art, if it. This is going to sound pretty stupid, but it's like if it's an artwork, maybe it's all right. I mean, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. 
Well, yeah, that's been very interesting recently, the whole question of censorship in one's... one's uh, yeah. Right. I guess if we're made in uh, laboratories, maybe we should be made with a little uh, less of uh, violence, uh, or the at least to counteract our, the times. If the times have been this way since Shakespeare, that doesn't mean that violence itself is necessarily a good uh, thing. Okay. Well, now, uh, see, listen to all that good uh, information. Uh, we're almost like the public TV uh, with all this uh, interesting uh -huh. talk. And Mr. Pendleton, maybe you'll find some new... Uh, Performers for your uh, Steppenwolf uh, company uh, before the <laughs> show is through. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, are you used to people that can sing and and uh, and do skits like that? And uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, no, I'm not used to this. Oh, okay. <laughs> not well, used to this. Well, we're, we're glad. To <laughs> so, <laughs> do you remember any of this, Austin? Was it just a weird afternoon for you? No, uh, no, I, it, a lot of it came back to me, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So you, your reaction was just, I'm not used to this. Um, so how, how so? Were they sharing a stage with these various eccentrics? or What was I said I wasn't used to? Uh, well, I was just asking if, you know, in that clip, it was just, you know, um, do you, maybe there are some performers here that could work with you on future shows. What do you think of that? And then your reaction was just, I'm I'm not used to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I wasn't. <laughs> I'm still not. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I don't uh, I don't recall how um, how you were booked on that show, um, but uh, often um, uh, David Green, who was the co-host, the sort of uh, quiet co-host, would often um, make the calls. I don't know if he had reached out to you or um, um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we just happened to see you on 59th Street walking and we just Yeah, said, yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it, it's a it's a very uh memorable episode and and uh people um, you know, uh, write to us uh, how much they enjoyed seeing you and and seeing you interacting with everybody. Um but um but uh I I want to go through some of uh some of the moments in your career and i want to i'm going to show some pictures to just kind of guide things along and so here uh fiddler fiddler so yeah. this was uh this was kind of this was your big debut broadway yes yeah and uh, and that's you at the center of the action there. Um, and uh, and that's zero. Joanna Merlin is the bride. Yes. Uh -huh. And um, uh, so what was it like being in such a big play at such an early stage in your career? With well, these stars? first of all, the first play I was in was was quite soon after I got to New York directed by Jerome Robbins. It was the first time he'd ever directed a straight play, first time he'd ever directed off-Broadway, and that was Oh Dad, Poor Dad, Mama's Hung You in the Closet, and I'm Feeling So Sad. Now, that was a character who stuttered, <clears throat> and I didn't particularly want to play a character who stuttered because I went into acting to get away from my stuttering. Mm -hmm. And uh, But, I mean, you're not going to turn down one of the leading roles in a Jerome Robbins play. <laughs> And, and so I got an audition for it, and I, I, and he cast me, and then, um, and then I, I at that point I was doing a lot of work on stuttering. It was very hard. I was in Odad for a year, and playing a character who stuttered it was very hard to control it. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, and then. <clears throat> Um, finally, I got fired from it after about a year because it just got out of control completely. And I was so relieved to be fired. But then I thought, yeah, but Jerry Robbins is never going to hire me again. But then just a few months later, he asked me to audition for what became Fiddler on the Roof. And um, he auditioned me for Perchick, the revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted that part. And I auditioned for it. And he came back and he said... Um, 
you've gotten completely over the stutter. This is amazing. Well, I wasn't totally over it. It was still, there were traces of it. But I lied. And then um, and then he finally cast me as the tailor, as Muddle the tailor. And then we went into rehearsal and there was still a little bit of a stutter. And we were rehearsing uh, in the summer on 55th Street. So we'd go all go to Central Park for lunch. And so he said to me, I, I noticed the stutter hasn't completely gone away. And I said, no, I kind of lied to you. And he said, well, it, it, first of all, there's no problem. First of all, it's way more under control. Secondly, it could even work for the character. But if you do get into a block, uh, which is what they call it, a block, when you, you know, if you do, if you do get into a block, try to work through it quickly because the show is three and a half hours long, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was so funny. And so then, were there... Were there moments doing Fiddler on the Roof where you would have a, a stuttering moment? And yeah, yeah, a little bit, not not anything very serious. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 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 Zero Mostel would have fun with that, mm -hmm. and then people would say, "Oh, how can he make?" I said, "No, no, I love that he makes light of it. <laughs> I love that he makes a little joke of it. It just takes the whole pressure off it." Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of adored when he would do that. <laughs> and, um, in fact, I loved acting with him. He he kind of set me free. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you were fortunate to work with some of these giants like Zero Mostel. Yeah. That were yeah, I'm, I'm sure at, at that age to to be able to to uh, you know learn so much uh, from these from these you know big stars. Um, and then, oh, Dad, poor Dad was Joe Van Fleet and Barbara Harris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there you go. And um, uh, so, OK, so so now this uh, this eventually leads to um, uh, movies in Hollywood. And uh, it brings us to this project. Skidoo. Skidoo. So I am going to be a contrarian on this front, um, Austin, because, uh, you know, a lot of people will criticize this film and I really find it. Fun to watch. I think there's a well, lot you of know, a, a funny thing happened with that film. Um, so first of all, I became a, a lifelong friend of Otto Preminger, who directed it. Mm -hmm. And and um, and so many great people were in it and working with them. But also when the film opened, it got hideous reviews. Mm -hmm. But then almost immediately it became a cult favorite. So it opened in january now when a, when a major studio like um oh, this was a paramount picture uh when they open a film in january it's a signal to the public this 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 movie is not going to work i mean they didn't open it for the well, the, the holiday for the holiday time when you know so right. it got terrible reviews and then almost immediately it became a cult uh, Columbia film students would come up to me on the subway and say, hey, man, you're in Skidoo. And then all, so it opened in very early 1969. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest of 1969, it played every Friday night at midnight on the Berkeley campus in California. Mm -hmm. it and there became instantly a cult favorite. And there were still a lot of, you know, strong performances in it. Jackie Gleason and, you know, and people were. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh and Groucho Marx. And, you know. Right. So yeah. I got to meet Groucho Marx. Right. <laughs> I got to have dinner with Groucho Marx. Wow. And, and uh, um, uh, you know, a lot of wonderful people were in. And Jackie Gleason was lovely. He was so sympathetic and he, he was so... Um, he was so great to act with and he was so um he was so there you know did did gleason and groucho because you were young at this point were they dispensing any advice to you on life on on work no no they were just friendly yep yep yeah. and they were both uh, very very friendly now today is uh, four twenty, so I guess I would be remiss to not ask. Um, this was around the late nineteen sixties. Were there drugs circulating? <laughs> not a, well. I, I suppose there were on some sets. I, I I was never on a set where there was. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, yeah. um, and and Otto was it, it, Otto Preminger was into experimenting with ducks, but he he never did it around the set. I mean, you know, on the weekend right. and stuff like LSD and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, um, he was a great director. He taught me. He taught me everything I know about film acting. Hmm. And what what would you say was one of the key things that he that he taught you about that? That every take is opening night. Hmm. So I mean, say you do eight takes of a scene, every every take is opening night. Wow. And, and also, he was very into what. Um, Already at that point, an acting teacher of mine, Robert Lewis, was into, he would emphasize in his classes, um, talking and listening. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Otto was really into, the, into that. And mm -hmm. then after, after I was in that film and I got to know him, and, and, and he could, we, we were friends for the rest of his life. Wow, and he would invite me and Katina, my wife, over for dinner. He had, he had a little townhouse on East Sixty Fourth, and we would go over, and then they had a screening room, and we'd go upstairs and watch a movie. But he, um, um, but he, that whole thing of talking and 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 listening that was a huge thing for him in in acting, and people like Joan Crawford, he he directed her in Daisy Kenyon. And she would admit in, in the years after that, he he made me be simple. Hmm. She would admit, you know, she, she was a little, she played it big usually. And right. he made her be simple. Hmm. And she always loved him for that. She, Joan Crawford, mm -hmm. always loved him for that. And... Um, and this is true of Otto. And, and then I would go to the film forum here in New York and see retrospectives of his work. And the quality of acting in those movies is remarkable. And it does have that talking, listening feeling. Mm -hmm. Not uh, not fair to just measure him by Skidoo. No. And, and, and as I say, Skidoo became, hmm, it's still a cult classic. Right, right. And uh, and then speaking of cult classics, so then you went on to this movie, yes. Catch Twenty Two, and this yes. is where you uh, there right next to you is Orson Welles. This is where you encountered Mr. Welles. Yes, and uh, and quite a few other stars in this uh, film. Alan yeah. Arkin. Well, well, well. I already knew Alan Arkin for from having worked with Barbara Harris because they were, they were both from that Chicago group, you know, the second city mm -hmm. and the improvisational group. And so I knew, and now I'd already been a play that, that Alan had directed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I knew him uh, quite well. Now Wells was difficult on this production. That's been, he was, a, he was a very bad boy. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was, he made it really rough for Mike Nichols. <laughs> and there was, I guess, no one who could say that to him. They would try, but I mean, he would do, here's what he would do. We would rehearse the scenes mm -hmm. and then you go out and sit while they, and, and we, and we were in the desert in Mexico. Um, you, and you go and, 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 and you sit while they prepare the lights and everything. Then we come back in, we're about to shoot the scene and Orson starts redirecting the scene. Wow. Redirecting all the actors. <laughs> and um, um, and he hurt the scenes he was in. And they were on page on 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 on, on the page and on paper, they were they were the funniest scenes in the, the script. Mm -hmm. That they're not that funny in the movie because he he would he wrecked them. So, so yeah. were you personally in the awkward position of having to take some of his direction or? Well, I would, I would, I would, I would take it. But then when we shot, I would do what Mike wanted. <laughs> <laughs> were there any repercussions? 
with uh, Orson over that? Or? No, I, I, I don't know. And he was very, um, he was impossible. He, he was a lot of fun. I mean, when we would all sit out there and, in, in, you know, in the high chairs you sit in and between, uh, when, I mean, while the lights were being set up and everything and inside, he would, he would hold forth on every, every movie director uh, either. He loathed Stanley Kubrick. He loathed him. Wow. Yeah. He, Was um, he envious of him or? Well, I think he, Stanley Kubrick figured out how to game the system. And, and make very personal films. And Orson had never figured out how to do that. Or in, well, in fact, Orson never figured out how to do that because he refused to do it. He would, he would, he wouldn't, he wouldn't work the system. Hmm. And um, so, um, but one thing I admired Charlton Heston for was a, a, a touch of evil. Heston just insisted on or Orson directing it, and um, um, and the studio had no desire for that. And Heston, who was in the peak of his career, then said, "I'm sorry that I'm not doing it." Wow! So it sounds like, from what you're saying, that Wells was uh, self sabotaging. Oh, <laughs> the term could have been invented for him, <laughs> but he reveled in it. He reveled in it. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so, um, okay, let's go to another one. This is... What's up, Doc? Oh, yeah. Um, so I've heard you speak about a number of these cast members, but I haven't heard much about Kenneth Mars. Any thoughts about him? Well, I was just looking at him. He was a genius. Hmm. He was, I mean... We all had to restrain ourselves when we were in scenes with him because he otherwise he would crack us up. Just just his work, the quality of his work. And he was he was great off off camera with me. Or, you know, I was in a place in my personal life and everything. And he would give me all this advice. And he was very sweet and very nice and and completely brilliant. And and Barbara Streisand, uh, this was the start of a relationship that uh, you you later worked with her again, right? Yes, right. She was great. She mm. was great, and she was very helpful to Madeline Kahn. Mm. It, it was the first time that Madeline had ever been in a movie, and Madeline was terrified. Mm. And and Barbara would take her side and give her little pieces of advice. She, she I mean, she wouldn't try to direct her because we. Peter Bogdanovich was the director, but she would just give give Madeline, Madeline little, little tips about screen acting that were very helpful to Madeline. Now, um, was Ryan O'Neill difficult at all back at this point? I mean, you know, he eventually was in the tabloids constantly as a, this difficult person. Um, was he, he, No, he was very sympathetic. I mean, he was very pleasant to all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a it was a good time on the set. Everyone was. Well, having it, was it was a good time. It was uh, that kind of comedy is very difficult. It's very demanding. Well, just you have to talk so fast. Mm -hmm. And so we would do these long takes and Peter would never do any coverage such as, you know, the close ups. So there would be a long scene where everybody's around a table or something and you're talking like that and everybody in the scene is praying to not be the one who screws it up right <laughs> and so that gives these scenes a certain electricity and 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 it was patterned after the comedies by howard hawks from the 1930s where everybody talked really fast so we would do take after take after take and then oh, there i'll look at that which dovetails very nicely into yeah. this project yeah. <laughs> um, as you said, this was, you know, based on the, the fast patter from the play. And, uh, yeah. The fun and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So how was this? Uh, how was this experience? You got to work with uh, Jack Lemmon. Walter Matthau's not there, but Harold Gould, uh, just a, a great cast on this uh, film. And Carol Burnett, who was and just heaven. She mm -hmm. is so sympathetic. And, and I had a lot of scenes with her. And she was so, um, um, she was wonderful. 
Do now, she eventually uh, has has told stories about how she was disappointed with how this film had turned out um, with her role, her acting. She she just wasn't uh, happy. She, she, she didn't like her. She once announced to a plane where the film was going to be be shown on the plane. She she said she took the mic from the the stewardess before the film began. And said, before the movie starts, I want to apologize publicly for my performance. <laughs> yeah, she she's a lovely lady. <laughs> you know. And uh, have you ever found yourself in that position where you've you've apologized for something you've you've done? Well, I've never publicly apologized, <laughs> <laughs> but but you can know, like in a bar. I've been known to apologize. Yes, right. So um, when I was going to uh, when I was going to NYU, I took a, a a theater in New York class, and we went around to different productions, and then we would write. You know, um, we'd we'd have to write essays about what the, what we saw in the performance. And one of the plays that we went to was uh, it was William Hurt in uh, Circle Rep did Richard II in 1982. Oh. which was set in the uh, Celtic world, 100 yeah. feet. And the, it just wasn't working. I don't know if you saw this production, but it, it, um, the, the professor um, during the intermission apologized to us and said, you know, I, I don't like what I'm seeing here. If any of you want to leave, you know, you can. Oh my God. Yeah. And <laughs> so... <laughs> Oh, uh, it, it was it was it was confusing because of the the way they said it in in, in this particular time you know yeah and, yeah mm -hmm. um and you know it got there was one point where um hurt and this and uh, another one of the actors are fighting and they're in the nude and it just was it was puzzling the whole thing yeah. wow um have you ever been in productions like that where it it just you know the reaction is just not <laughs> positive. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, what I, happens? The show must go on. You have to keep. You just keep well, going. Yeah. I, the, I, I I was in a show once where I I simply didn't know how to do what the director wanted. I I just simply uh, a talented director, but but I just couldn't figure the way of the way of work was um, very very hard for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I apparently got terrible, terrible reviews at it, you know, which I deserved. <laughs> and and um, so, yeah, it's um, um, uh, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes. It's, it's just going to happen. They're not all going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's just true. And mm -hmm. and, uh, you know. It's hard to pinpoint whose fault. In in that case, it was it was my fault. Although halfway through the run, it was a limited run, it, um, a subscription thing. Halfway through the run, it suddenly came to me, and then it was thrilling. Hmm. It was thrilling. Wow. Once it came to me, once I was suddenly able to do. But it was on a night when at the intermission, I decided I was going to quit that night. And I knew and I had a talented understudy and I knew that everybody was going to be happy. And then at the intermission, I just thought I have just one hour to go and I'm out of here. Everybody's going to be happy. I'll be happy. And I went down and it happened. So obviously wow. I, I didn't quit that night. <laughs> Well, so was it just a feeling of you had nothing to lose and and you were liberated? Yeah, I guess so. I guess once I let it go, it flourished. Huh. Okay. Um, so uh, let me call up another one. So this is, uh, so I noticed you did a lot of um, TV work, uh, lots of TV work, uh, going all the way back to the 70s, Love American Style and... Yeah, right. And this appearance on Good Times. And I oh, thought this was interesting because the plot line was about the youngest uh, boy, Michael, um, 
uh, failing a, a test, some standardized test, because uh, and it got into this whole discussion about how the the test wasn't um, uh, worded uh, fairly for for minorities and. And this was back in 1975 or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to now when, you know, the SATs aren't even being accepted at a lot of colleges. And um uh really? so, Is that true. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. when you were doing uh pro so that when you were doing projects like that with Norman Lear, like um um, even though it was comedy, was there any feeling like you were addressing some social important social issues or no uh -huh. <laughs> so, it's just uh, um you know um you don't think that way about projects you work on you accept the job like say if you're acting in it you accept the job and then you try to do what the director says and you just think about that got it so yeah. so see, see if you start the reason for that is if you start trying to think about the larger issues, it stops you in your tracks. Mm. So you just don't think about those. You just think about the part and what's supposed to be happening in the scene and what the other actors are doing. That if if you start to think the larger thoughts, you just paralyze yourself. So you were uh, so you, you've never been an actor that um, it just will work exclusively in theater. Um, so you've done plenty of TV, plenty of movies, plenty of theater. Are these all equal loves of yours? Um, is there a preference? Well, if I had to pick one, which would be horrible, I'd probably pick theater. Mm. Now there, there. Are, there are reasons to pick movie or TV. Part of it is you get paid more, and also that it's always there. It's always there, which is that's the opposite of theater, where once it's gone, it's gone. Right. And and um, but um, so I'm just happy I've never had to make that choice. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and here's another TV project i'm not sure if this even aired but you tell me um this was you're gonna love it here oh ethel merman a pilot with ethel merman you were playing her son this was 1977 and there the three the three leads were ethel merman and me and this little kid named chris barnes who the year before had been in the bad news bears ah okay and chris barnes was um well he was like seven years old or something and he and ethel did not get along at all it was hysterically funny <laughs> he and ethel didn't get along she she was marvelous a marvelous lady <laughs> wonderful kind hearty was the lady and i think a superb perform actress and performer and he he was too he was the opposite of her he was very quiet he you know for an eight-year-old or seven-year-old or whatever he was he was very internal mm. but wildly gifted but you but you got along with ethel merman well oh yeah well yeah and and i i i already knew her i, I mean i already slightly knew her um i'm good friends with her son whose name is bob levitt and um um and i and bob and i had worked together at the american conservatory theater in san francisco and um, and Ethel would come to the shows, you know, and and you know, so I got to know her that way. Was it um, uh, was it uh, disappointing? Was it a blessing or a curse that you never um, got kind of that sitcom, you know, the way Judd Hirsch did? Or I I I think I I'm not sure I wanted that. Mm -hmm. Um, now, people as fantastic as Judge Hirsch um, and and other people who had very successful um, um, uh, uh, TV series, a lot of them flourished from that. But a lot of them were the public stuck 
they didn't want to see them in anything else. Right. So they didn't want to see them in a, in a play or a movie or anything. And and um, I was always afraid of that. And uh, and an example of that. Um, so you were famously in in my cousin Vinny. Uh, many people remember you for playing the lawyer in in my cousin Vinny. And the uh, the judge, right, Fred Gwynn, had this issue, right? He he was sort of he was so good in the Munsters that he was forever known as Herman Munster, and even though he was a very accomplished actor, yeah, yeah. It, See, that was the kind of thing I was afraid of. No, he was he was a great guy, by the way. Mm. Fred Gwynn, he, and I, I was in two or three movies with him, and he was he was a great guy. How? Um, uh, was it? Do you, do you know if if it was difficult getting him to appear in that movie in that comedic role because he wasn't doing a lot of that type of thing? Well, I think well, it was directed by Jonathan Lynn, who's a, a good friend of mine. I saw him just the other night, and um, Jonathan was able to get a lot of good actors in his movies because Jonathan himself was a success in those days a successful actor mm -hmm. and um um so he was able to corral a lot of good actors into his movies got it and um we have a question uh austin from sean riggle we need the hulk hogan stories if they exist which they have to exist so you were in a movie with hulk hogan yeah called called mr nanny i think was the name of it Mr. Nanny. Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan was amazing. Like at lunchtime, a bus would arrive. And um, kids would come out, kids who were brought from a hospital who had like terminal cancer. Hmm. And Hulk Hogan would spend the lunch hour with them hmm. and just talk to them and try to make them feel. And they knew they were dying. I mean, kids six, seven, eight years old. And that's what he's like. Hmm. Hmm. And and uh, he's also a good actor. I mean, and like I would I, I would have scenes with him and and um, in in one scene, he was brought to tears, you know. Hmm. And and he said uh, afterward, he said. Oh, I'm 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 sorry. I started to cry or something. I said, "Listen, I, I forget his. I didn't call him Hulk. <laughs> I, f I forget what his name. But um, he would. Um, I said, look, you're an. You, stop telling me you're not an actor. I would say to him, you are an actor. When an actor acts with somebody who's an actor, they know it." Hmm. When when you were in a scene with him, he was right there. Oh, wow! Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's he was amazing, an amazing man. Um, there's also a question. This is off the beaten trail. What does Austin think about artificial intelligence? Is this something you've given much thought to? No, I don't. I I mean I. Uh, I haven't thought about it that much, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, 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 I, I, I respect the question. <laughs> and I, yeah. And there's some clarification that Hulk's real name is Terry. Terry. That's right. Terry. That's, that's. <laughs> um, okay. Let's take a look at another project of yours. Um, and this one, you just have no idea what's coming up when I'm, uh, Hitting these. <laughs> I would say to Terry, to Hulk, I would say, how do you do that with those kids? And he just did. You know? Yeah. Oh, this is from uh, Simon with Alan Arkin. Yes. Yeah. So this was a... Rachel Brickman. This yeah, one. curious project. Um, what when so when you're shooting and you did some, you know, you've done some interesting movies that are a little, you know, offbeat, and this one certainly is. That, um, that's another cult favorite, and it, it remains a cult favorite to this to this day. So when you were shooting this, and because it was so peculiar, um, what 
What's the feeling when you're shooting a movie like this? Is it like, wow, how is this going to be received? What, you know, is this working? How did you, you never know shoot? with a movie? You never know. Mm-hmm. You you just don't know. So you so much don't know that you just stop worrying about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You do the script and yeah. yeah. And, and 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 you show up and you do what the director says and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh let me see what else we have here. Uh Marshall and- Brickman was is a wonderful director. I mean he he really t- is he's very specific about what he wants and he's very clear about it so that helps a great deal uh but even with him you treated each take like opening night oh, oh well, yeah that's that's what you have to do in movies <laughs> what's the oh what is this first thing? family so uh, this is a curiosity um it it was uh it just had a phenomenal cast. Uh, Fred Willard, who was on our Beyond Vaudeville show twice, and um, and Richard Benjamin, the, the whole cast here. This is only a part of the cast. Um, any yeah. memories about that project? Well, it was fun. Uh, <laughs> Look at all those people. There's Madeline Kahn, and and there's... Um, uh, Gilda Radner, Newhart. Radner. And, and uh, yeah, and... Dick Benjamin and uh, yeah, Fred. Oh yeah, Fred Willard. Yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, it was fun to make that movie. Was there any um, improvisation involved with Fred no. being there? No, no, not at all. No. And would you say um, and Bob Newhart? Bob Newhart. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> any memories of Bob Newhart? He was sweetest fellow that there could be and and still going in his 90s he is still going great yeah yeah <laughs> well he's amazing <laughs> quiet um, pretty supportive you know were there um were there any movies where um you did have some um uh ability to improvise or was it typically i know Hmm. No. Okay. Yeah. It would, which, which is good because I'm not that good at improvising. Hmm. Is 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 that what you were possibly referencing when you were on Beyond Vaudeville and you said I'm not used to this? Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get to the bottom of that before we're through. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> possibly. Um. Guarding Tess, put this one in here just because Nicolas Cage is kind of a, a curiosity, done some phenomenal work. Um, yeah. Um, any, and, any and, thoughts? And I, on- I was also, I played this sh- uh, 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 sh- chauffeur to Shirley MacLaine. Uh-huh. That was fun. <laughs> we, we would sit in the car between takes with me in the front seat, of course, and her in the back seat. And we would just talk and talk, and she would say the most amazing things. <laughs> she's, she's just fascinating person. Any um, anything specific you remember about it? I... No, yeah. just I mean, we I mean we were on on that set on and off for two or three, two or three or four weeks, and she. Um, there was never an uh, uninteresting conversation with her. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but you also did the the Muppet movie. And I had read that you did that somewhat reluctantly, but it worked out because you reunited with Charles Durning, who then got you the part in Starting Over. That's right. And so um, is has this been one of the mantras of your career to be open to opportunities because things well, like that happen. The, 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 thing, the thing with Charlie Durning is he was in Fiddler on the Roof on the road. Mm-hmm. And we, we hung out a lot. We, we, um, um, but his part was removed before it came to New York. But, but we were in Detroit for five weeks in Fiddler where we got horrible reviews. Mm-hmm. And we were, we were uh, in big trouble. And, and, and 
and Charlie and and Charlie and I would hang out after um, rehearsals and performances in the bar across the street, and that's how we got to know each other. Then we ended up in a lot of movies together. Like he's in the front page, mm -hmm. and he's in and as you say, he's in Starting Over and um, the Muppet movie. And we would in in the Muppet movie again. I'm I'm the chauffeur, and we would, you know, just sit. We had scenes that were shot in the middle of the night because we, because we're driving around, you know, and all that. And we would just sit and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. He was a great guy. <laughs> and um, and there's mention of uh, greedy with Kirk Douglas and Michael J. Fox. Someone's asking about that. Um, yeah, that I had a small part in that. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't. That wasn't was not on my radar, but it, it looks like people are looking on IMDb at your credit. That, that's also a Jonathan Lynn movie. Okay. Yeah. You know, as, as my cousin Minnie was, and all that. Okay, and um, well, you've been so generous with your time here, um, uh, Austin, and I. Um, uh, I know you have coming up. You're doing uh, a cabaret show with uh, Barbara Blyer. Mm -hmm. um, and you've done some other shows with her before, but, but these coming up May 2nd and 9th at the Pangea in New York. Um, yeah. And maybe what, what's that show going to be uh, this time around? Well, also in that is Gretchen Cryer and Richard Maltby. Mm -hmm. And so it has a lot of songs by Gretchen Cryer and Nancy Ford and a lot of songs by Richard Maltby and David Shire. In fact, I think just about all the songs are are by either of those two teams. So, um, and each of whom, by the way, are still going strong. Some of the new Cryer Ford songs are among their best. And 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 the new Maltby and Shire songs are among their best. So they're just going. And I've known all those people since I was at Yale. So, um, and, uh, and since you mentioned Yale, you actually, you were not a theater major at Yale. Correct. No, no. What was your major when you were at Yale? English or something, you know. Yeah. But it I was thought, all the extracurricular but, stuff. Yeah, the there's a group, the the extracurricular group there at at, at Yale is, is is and it's still called the Dramat. And I think I was in every play that they did while I was there, other than the two that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And and um, uh, so. That was thrilling. We had wonderful directors, and we had, you know, Nico Sekaropoulos and Bill Francisco and Lee Starn, fabulous directors. And it was, it was, that was like going to the graduate school, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't in the graduate school. Mm -hmm. That's where I met Gretchen Cryer and Richard Maltby and Joanna Glass, who's a playwright that I know. She was in the shows, and um, 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 so you know, yeah, long-standing relationship. So anyone going to this will get to see Austin sing. Ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And um, and you're also going. You're uh, uh, still active with Steppenwolf in Chicago. We talked about that back on Beyond Vaudeville. You still are. You're going to be acting in uh, the Harold Pinter play No Man's Land. That's coming That's up. Right. That's right. Uh, in the fall, that's, or no? That's that's in the summer. I um, it'll uh, I I go back to Chicago to rehearse it in the middle of June, and I come back home in the middle of August. Okay, and uh, promise us you are writing an autobiography. I'm writing. It's called a memoir. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how far along is that? I'm about halfway through it. I think. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I guess, Austin, my final question, um, when do you retire? I have no particular plans to retire. <laughs> I retire, I guess, when the profession retires me. <laughs> <laughs> so continuing to act, continuing to teach, working on your autobiography. Um, uh, I thank you so much for doing this. Um, if um, uh, anyone out there who's watching, who has enjoyed this, and I'm sure you have with such a great guest, um, please uh, hit like, please hit subscribe. Um, uh, Austin, I'll see if there's one last question from the audience here. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Love you and Sergeant Bilko. And uh, it's also I, a Jonathan Lynn movie. Oh, uh, wow. So yeah. quite a few. You've, mm -hmm. Yeah. And any. Uh, OK, last question. Any stories uh, or let's say story with Geraldine Page? Oh, yeah. I directed her once in a production of of in the production of Ghosts, the play by Ibsen. And um, the director who had directed it was a very talented John Strasberg, but he had to leave and go um, after the first preview. He had to he had to go to Europe. He had a commitment, and um, so they called me in to take over the direction during the previews. And so that I I slightly knew Geraldine Page, hmm. but. But then working with her, oh my God, what an inventive actress! And she would, you would, you you would give her a really complicated direction, and she would say, um, "Well," um, and and I'd say, "But we don't have to put this in tonight because it's really complicated." She said, "No, no, tell me what you want." And I would give her this really complex, it's an Ibsen play, you know, so I'd give her this really complex direction. And there it would be that night, all of it on stage. <laughs> she was amazing. Would um, So when you're working with someone like that, is it intimidating for you? Uh, how? No, because the great thing about people like that is they don't intimidate you. They, that that's not their, that's not what they do. They, they immediately welcome you as a collaborator. That all the greats, that's what they do. And Elizabeth Taylor was the same way? Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. And the most generous soul that ever lived was Elizabeth Taylor. So so it's yeah, it sounds like you've worked with all these giants and they're all you know what I'll, I'll I'll tell you one story about what Elizabeth Taylor did. Mm -hmm. So we did the Little Foxes, and uh, we got five Tony nominations, and we lost them all. We, I mean, we, I mean, I mean, we got the nominations, but in all five nominations, we did not win. So afterwards, there's a party, you know, for the, you know, after after the Tony Awards, mm -hmm. and Elizabeth tapped her 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 fork on a glass, you know, and the room fell silent. She said, "Tomorrow night after the performances." Um, of all our different shows. Anyone in any category who lost tonight is invite, I'm inviting them to a party tomorrow night on the second floor at Sardi's. <laughs> so the next, so, so in every category, the designers, the actors, the, the directors, everything, everybody came to this party who had lost. <laughs> a celebration party for all the losers. Yeah. She made it, she made it so that, that, Everybody wanted to be a, wanted to have been a loser, <laughs> and and um, that that was so her. That was a good way to turn it around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The generosity of that was just so, and it was so kind of, it was generous and and witty. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it, it just as you are, Austin. Uh, you are very generous in doing this. You're very generous in in all that you've done in your career and helping people. And uh, we appreciate you coming on our show way back when. I appreciate you coming on this now. We have uh, some somebody wrote in, in the chat that they saw you from afar in Baltimore and still regrets not saying hello, uh, Jane Brett Schneider. So uh, Jane, I would say if you happen to uh, run into this man in the street again, very politely say hello. Oh, do that. Yes, please do that. Yeah. <laughs> Right. All right. Thank you again so much, uh, Austin, and uh, looking forward to your continued great work. Thank you so much, Rich. This is terrific. I really enjoyed this. Same here. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.